There can't be many artists whose work is more instantly recognisable than Andy Warhol. From the late 1940s until his death in 1987, he produced over 9,000 paintings and sculptures and nearly 12,000 drawings. But he also made hundreds of films and had a profound impact on the art world by forcing it to decide what is and what isn't art. He achieved global fame, wealth and cult status within his own lifetime. But behind the glitz and glamour of his celebrity-filled world was a man who struggled to navigate the uncertainties and complexities of everyday life. Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Yorston, and today we're embarking on a fascinating journey into the life and mind of one of the most iconic artists of the 20th century, Andy Warhol. We'll explore his extraordinary journey from his humble beginnings to becoming a cultural icon. We'll examine his artistic genius, his rise to fame, and the personal trials he faced along the way. So join me as we step into the world of Andy Warhol. Andrew Warhol was born in Pittsburgh in 1928, the youngest of the three sons of Andre and Julia, recent immigrants to the US from what is now Slovakia, but of Rusin heritage, a distinct ethnic group with its own culture and language. Times were tough, and at first they had to make do with living in a two-room tar paper shack. His father worked hard as a miner and in the steelworks, but with a downturn in demand in the Great Depression, he was sometimes out of work, leaving the family with barely enough to survive. Julia was deeply religious, and the whole family attended Mass every week at the Byzantine Catholic Church. She doted on her sons, especially her youngest, Andy who was a small and delicate child. The boys didn't learn English until they started school, and Julia always struggled with the language. Andy was also very sensitive, and his brother later recalled that he was often picked on for being a crybaby. But he showed an early talent for drawing and painting, and attended free art lessons at the Carnegie Institute, now the Carnegie Museum of Art, where he was taught in huge classes of up to 600 on a Saturday morning by Joseph Fitzpatrick, a talented modernist painter himself. Fitzpatrick later said, I distinctly remember how individual Warhol's style was. From the very start, he was quite original. Andy learned to draw surrounded by the museum's permanent collection, but also saw world-class exhibitions of Picasso and Henri Rousseau and American primitive artists, all of whom had a major influence on his later style. He attended Holmes Elementary School, but at the age of eight, he developed rheumatic fever and was off sick for eight weeks. Although much less common in developed countries today, rheumatic fever was the leading cause of death in children in the 1920s in the United States. It occurs two to four weeks after a streptococcal throat infection or scarlet fever as a result of the body making antibodies against its own tissues. It begins with a fever and painful joints and some children develop involuntary muscle movements and weakness, known as Sydenham's chorea, a characteristic non-itchy rash, nodules under the skin, and damaged heart valves. Sydenham's chorea, or St Vitus dance, after the saint who was boiled alive as a martyr in ancient Rome, is characterised by rapid, uncoordinated jerking and writhing movements, shoulder shrugging, dance-like head movements, grimacing, lip pouting, and repeated snake-like protrusions of the tongue. Around half of children also have non-specific behavioural changes, such as labile emotions, irritability and regression, and some become anxious and depressed, or develop phobias. The commonest mental health condition associated with Sydenham's career, however, is obsessive-compulsive disorder, 
and this is something that Warhol struggled with throughout his life. The movements can last for several months and often recur during subsequent streptococcal infections. And the psychiatric symptoms, as in Warhol's case, can be lifelong. In his weeks of being confined to bed, fussed over by his mother and fed Campbell's soup, Warhol drew and listened to the radio for hours, collecting photographs and cutting out pictures of movie stars from magazines to put around his bed establishing his lasting fascination with popular culture. The disease also took its toll on Andy's complexion, leaving him pale with white patches on his face and a reddened, swollen nose. So that when he was able to get back to school, he was greeted with the nickname Spot and Andy the Red-Nosed Warhola. His skin made him feel self-conscious and unattractive for the rest of his life. When he was 13, his father died suddenly while working for a removals company in West Virginia. He had never been sick before, and when his body was brought into the house, Andy was so scared he ran and hid under the bed. Later in 1942, he began at Shenley High School. In his autobiography, he wrote, I wasn't very close to anyone. I wasn't the type they wanted to confide in, I guess. Academically, however, he did well, getting straight A's. But it was wartime, and schools were pushing young men through as quickly as possible so they could graduate before being drafted. So Andy skipped the 11th grade and entered his last year at Shenley in September 1944. This coincided with his mother being diagnosed with colon cancer and having to go in for surgery, for which she was given only a 50-50 chance of surviving. But survive she did, living to the age of 81, always with her son so she could take care of him. He won a Scholastic Art and Writing Award from the National Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, an organisation that has recognised a lot of major artists and writers early in their careers. Sylvia Plath, Stephen King, Cy Twombly and Truman Capote. Despite their poverty, Andy's father managed to save up $1,500 before he died for one of his sons to go to college. With his artistic talent already evident, the whole family knew it was going to be Andy who got the education. In 1945, still aged only 17, he began at the Carnegie Institute of Technology, now the Carnegie Mellon University, where he studied pictorial design. One of his classmates, Martha Sutherland, remembers him as a timid and rather nervous young man, but with plenty of friends despite his odd looks. She said, He was part of a group where the action was. Either he collected people around him, or they coalesced around him. He was sort of outrageous in his way. He was different and good. Everyone knew how good he was. Martha bought one of his early paintings for $30, eventually donating it to the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas. But despite his undoubted talent, he managed to fail a class in his first year at Carnegie. Thought and expression, as his essay writing let him down, never one of his strengths. And he had difficulty with most of his classes in his first year, not completing assignments on time, or as directed, throwing together slapdash projects, or chopping up a single painting and turning it into four separate pieces, or in some other way presenting work that was just different to everybody else. Sculptor and painter Sidney Simon, another fellow student, said of Andy, They couldn't teach him anything, and he couldn't learn anything. He had his own style and direction from the beginning. Because of this, the faculty who graded student work through a jury system couldn't agree as to whether Andy's work was any good or not, and his assignments often passed by just a single vote. One of his teachers later said, If anyone would have asked me who was least likely to succeed, I would have said Andy Warhola. But he certainly wasn't isolated or reclusive, and he joined the college's Modern Dance Club and Beaux-Arts Society. 
He was art director of the Student Art Magazine, illustrating a cover for it in 1948, his first published artwork, which already demonstrates his signature blotted line technique. Many of his friends had their college education interrupted by military service, but Warhol somehow managed to avoid it. An early draft registration card rated him medically 1A, making him eligible for call-up, but a later one during the Korean War rated him 4F, rendering him ineligible, although no reason is given for the change. It's interesting to imagine how he might have got on in the army. All that quirky individuality isn't something the military usually values. I wonder if he might have ended up in hospital, like Yves Saint Laurent in France a few years later. A week after graduating in 1949, Warhol moved to New York City. He started off sharing an eighth floor apartment in Manhattan's East Village with a classmate, Philip Perlstein. It was far from luxurious and had a bathtub in the kitchen which was usually full of roaches. But post-war America was booming and both found work quickly. Perlstein doing industrial catalogue jobs and Warhol illustrating department store catalogues. In those early days, Warhol worked hard, both with his art and with marketing himself, walking around to agents and art directors' offices with a shopping bag full of his work. Perlstein described his roommate as an obsessive workaholic who continued working late into the night long after he had gone to bed. It was around this time that he decided to drop the final A in his name to become Andy Warhol. His first commercial work appeared in a 1949 issue of Glamour, a magazine for the girl with a job in which he illustrated a series of stories defining what is success. But it wasn't all work. He mixed in a circle of ex Carnegie Tech artists and other bohemian types, moving frequently from one sublease to the next. Warhol and Perlstein moved to Chelsea to share a cavernous room in an old firehouse with dancer and pioneering dance therapist Francisca Boas, who ran a dance class in one half of the room while the boys worked in the other half, with Francisca's huge sheepdog wandering between the two. In April 1950, Warhol moved to 103rd Street. He shared a large room which was completely bare except for unmade beds on the floor, and Andy's drawing table, a rather grand architectural draftsman's table, with a light and all of his pens and inks neatly lined up, everything in its place. One of his flatmates, Elaine Finn Silver, a dancer, recalled that she would be coming home from work just as the others were getting up and having breakfast at six o'clock in the evening. She didn't find him to be a hard worker at all. It was in these early New York days that he developed his signature blotted line technique, a method he had experimented with at Carnegie, applying ink to paper and then blotting it while still wet in a kind of rudimentary printmaking process. Somehow, the end result captured the less formal post-war zeitgeist perfectly, and the technique allowed him to repeat images and make colour and compositional changes quickly in response to client requests. And editors loved him, commenting that he wasn't at all precious about his work, and always willing to tweak his illustrations to accommodate their demands. He had some pretty serious clients, even at this early stage of his career album covers for Columbia Records, Christmas cards for Tiffany's, Fogue, and whimsical illustrations for leather goods company Fleming Joff, whose owner said, he walked in, we loved his work, and we hired him. One tactic he used to help people remember his name was to begin conversations in a completely offbeat way. Hello, I'm just sitting on my bed here, playing with my yo-yo. Oh, I planted some bird seed in the park yesterday. Would you like to order a bird? Different, but it worked. In 1952, his mother Julia moved into his Upper East Side apartment. Julia was an artist in her own right. Cats and angels, mainly. 
but she lived with her son for pretty much the rest of her life, cooking for him, badgering him to find a wife, and cleaning up after their 20 or so cats, all called Sam. The illustrations he did for a CBS radio show, The Nation's Nightmare, highlighting the dangers of drugs, won him an Arts Directors Club medal and increased his already growing profile. Also in 1952, he had his first solo show at the Hugo Gallery in New York. It was themed around writer Truman Capote. A stage version of his novel, The Grass Harp, had recently premiered on Broadway and Warhol was obsessed with Capote, who recalled that, when he came to New York, he used to stand outside my house, just stand out there all day, waiting for me to come out. He wanted to become a friend of mine, wanted to speak to me, talk to me. He nearly drove me crazy. The exhibition was sparsely attended, however, and one reviewer said the work had an air of precocity, of carefully studied perversity. But his commercial work continued to be in demand, and to make sure it stayed that way, he produced a series of self-published books throughout the 1950s, which he would give out as gifts to potential clients. The books would be hand-coloured by himself and friends at colouring parties held at Serendipity 3, a boutique coffee shop. The following year, he got involved with the 12th Street Players, a theatre group that put on off-Broadway performances of modern and challenging plays. One of the group's founders said, Andy was about as dreary and colourless as anybody could possibly be. He faded into the woodwork. So, he was relegated to designing sets. In 1954, he produced Holy Cats as one of his promotional gifts. But the pictures were not by Andy at all, but by his mother. And he continued to use her distinctive and upbeat calligraphy on hundreds of his drawings, advertisements, album covers and book illustrations. In 1955, he met Charles Lysenby. Andy was smitten. Lysenby was not, finding him socially awkward, saying, At parties he would just sit in a corner. He didn't socialise, didn't talk to anyone. He really did not know how to mix. He didn't know how to join in and have fun and meet people. He had no social graces. Nonetheless, they became friends, and Lysenby collaborated on his book, 25 Cats Name Sam and One Blue Pussy. It was around this time that Warhol had the first of a number of cosmetic surgeries to remove excess skin from his nose. The details are not known, but one suggestion is that he had a condition called rhinophyma and was simply having the overgrowing flesh planed off rather than his nose shape altered. He would also work out two or three times a week at the YMCA on 23rd Street to build up his pecs. In 1956, he began working for the upmarket but slightly tired footwear store Israel Miller. Warhol's quirky designs and illustrations transformed the company and brought it right up to date, and he was given an annual retainer of $12,000, which would be worth more than 10 times that now. Artist and writer John Coplands recalled that nobody drew shoes the way Andy did. He somehow gave each shoe a temperament of its own a sort of sly Toulouse-Lautrec kind of sophistication. Those that Miller didn't use, he took to the Serendipity Cafe and sold for $15 a piece. But his eye for fashion didn't always extend to his own appearance at this time. Carlton Willers, his first boyfriend, said, He always looked bedraggled, always had his tie lopsided, as he didn't have time to tie it, and he never tied his shoelaces, and he always wore a cap, even at dinner parties, because he was very self-conscious about going bald. I'd tell him to get a hairpiece, and he finally did, around 1955. It made him look younger. He was acutely self-conscious of himself. He thought he was totally unattractive. He was given the nickname of Raggedy Andy, and one time he opened his portfolio to show his work to the art director at Harper's Bazaar, and a cockroach crawled out. In 1955, he met Ralph Pomeroy, and they decided to collaborate on a new book, 
à la recherche du chou perdu. In February 1956, he had a solo exhibition at the Bodley Gallery called Studies for a Boy Book. The book never appeared, but his drawings of young men and erotic portrayals of male nudes was brave at a time when same-sex relationships were still very much illegal. They're a bit too graphic for YouTube. And whilst they're probably not everybody's cup of tea, they do show a sense of humour which isn't always evident in his other work. Three months later, one of his less controversial shoe drawings was included in the Museum of Modern Art's exhibition, Recent Drawings USA. Also in 1956, he embarked on a two-month round-the-world trip with Charles Lysenby. Hawaii, Japan, Thailand, the temples of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, and India, where Lysenby became ill. They also planned to visit Egypt, but their plane landed in Cairo in the middle of the Suez Crisis, so they went to Italy and Amsterdam instead. Another planned book that was never published was a collaboration with latest assistant Ted Carey, called The Cock Book. I can't imagine why he didn't go through with that one. I'm sure people would have been fascinated by his drawings of chickens. In 1957, he went a little safer and produced The Gold Book and had a linked exhibition at the Bodley Gallery, A Show of Golden Pictures, which were based on photographs by Edward Wallowich, his next boyfriend. But when Wallowich had to go into a clinic for an alcohol detox and his brother asked Andy for some money to help with the fees, he refused, blaming his business manager. This was something Warhol would repeat many times over the years and led to him developing a reputation as someone who used people and then discarded them when they became difficult. In 1958, his mother Julia won her own design award from the American Institute of Graphic Arts for her calligraphy on a record sleeve, The Story of Moondog, featuring the music of eclectic musician Lewis Hardim. All of his books thus far he had given away as promotional gifts, but in 1959 he produced wild raspberries, hand-coloured illustrations of whimsical faux recipes, but it was not a success. It was about the only thing that wasn't successful in a decade which saw his commercial art blossom, and his circumstances changed from living in one roach-infested dive after another to buying a five-storey townhouse on Lexington Avenue. But it will be in the 60s that he would really achieve global fame. Most of his iconic images date from this time, and he expanded into music production, film, sculpture and multimedia, and just being a celebrity. The 60s was also the decade when his life almost came to an abrupt end when he was shot by disgruntled radical feminist Valerie Solanas. I'll cover this and the highs and lows of the second half of his life in part two. So please subscribe and click for notifications and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.